If the 700 series was a gamble for Volvo's survival, the 850 was an even bigger bet. It's like betting the company on black, then taking all your winnings and putting it on black again. The 850 costs more than any previous industrial project in Sweden, and if it didn't sell well, Volvo would be so heavily in debt it would be finished. But it did sell 1.2 million cars in nine years, and Volvo created a successful product line that it sells to this day. This is the Volvo 850 story. The story of the 850, released in 1991, starts 13 years before in 1978, while Volvo was developing the 700 series. Despite little money to pour into new cars, work began on a smaller companion to the 700 series. The new car, codenamed Project Galaxy, wouldn't just be a new large car. It would be shortened and used as a replacement for Volvo's 300 series, produced in the Netherlands and a product of Volvo's initial 1972 investment in the DAF car and truck company. The smaller car would be codenamed G1 and the larger G2. But the main problem Volvo faced with both the G1 and the G2 was getting an effective engine and transmission package. Early on, it had been decided that both cars would be front-wheel drive. This would mean more space for passengers and was the direction competing cars were moving in, but it meant mounting the engine transversely. So the first problem was finding an engine that would work in the smaller G1, yet give enough power for the G2. Volvo decided that despite its finances, they needed a new generation of engines, so kicked off the X100 program to develop a four-cylinder engine with the flexibility to make it into a five-cylinder or even a six-cylinder. A new transverse engine would need a small gearbox to fit into that tight engine bay. The manual gearbox was investigated first, a five-speed to keep up with the competition. There was no good solution from outside Volvo, so it was decided to design one in-house. By 1980, Volvo had a rough prototype ready, dubbed G4, that would be the father of both the smaller G1 and the larger G2. It was fitted with a 1.8-litre aluminium four-cylinder X100 engine, plus the new gearbox. Later that year, Volvo had refined the G4 into the smaller G1 prototype, and the following year had developed a G2 prototype. Some of the design cues developed here will be seen in the 1990 series facelift that would produce a family look for both cars. The gearbox was refined using three separate shafts to fit it into that small space, whereas most gearboxes at that time used only two shafts. The Volvo 760 was launched in 1982, and its immediate success would provide a much-needed funding boost to kick Project Galaxy into high gear. The X100 engine needed refinement, and needed also to be larger than the 1.8 litre four-cylinder to power a car as large as the G2. Volvo settled on a five-cylinder, but a six-cylinder would also be explored, with Volvo approaching Porsche to do the work. This didn't work out, so it was actually Volvo who completed the six-cylinder, but they worked with Porsche on refining the engine for production. To understand how the engine and gearbox would work in a real car, they needed a mule to put it in, that is, a body and four wheels to test how it would work. They found the perfect car to put it in, the Chevrolet Citation. Although if you think about it, that's a bit of an odd name to call a car. A Citation is a court summons, something you get if you've been pulled over by the police. It's been estimated that there are around a million words in the English language, and I'd like to think there's probably 900,000 words that would work better for a car than the name Citation. But then what do I know? The Citation was the number one selling car in 1980 when it launched in North America. So, Volvo found the perfect car, or at least the perfect size car, in the Citation. Its engine bay and front-wheel drive layout was an almost perfect match for Project Galaxy, so the car became the test vehicle to ensure Volvo's new engine and transmission would have the reliability Volvo were calling for. That was 200,000 kilometres without major work, and a car that would be on the road for 20 years. Volvos were known for their safety features, and the company tried to make them the safest cars on the road. They were always looking for new ways to make their cars safer, and Niels Bolin headed a team to produce what would become known as the Side Impact Protection System, or SIPS. It included reinforcing structures within the side body and energy-absorbing materials within the doors. 
With it arriving too late to be included when the 700 series was introduced, the Project Galaxy team decided it would launch on their car. Volvo wanted a class-leading car when it came to handling. They worked on developing the rear suspension with a split rear axle. It would include bushings on the axle that compressed under load, giving the car passive rear steering to help stability through fast corners. With the X100 engine and manual gearbox progressing well, Volvo turned its attention to a new diesel that would round out the range plus an automatic gearbox. Like the manual, there wasn't an automatic already on the market that would fit into the small space Volvo had given themselves, so a new one had to be built from scratch. And having one was imperative. Large luxury cars in the 1980s needed an automatic gearbox, especially in North America, Volvo's key sales market. So if it couldn't be built, the project couldn't continue without major rework. Two competing designs of the automatic gearbox were created. The first would only fit with four-cylinder versions of the X100 engine, making it a non-starter given more five-cylinder and six-cylinder customers would choose an automatic. The second design by Asian Warner showed promise and worked with all versions of the X100, so Volvo went with this design. Volvo started work on the car styling in 1983 with two competing prototypes, dubbed P1 and P2. Both designs had good bits in them, so a P3 amalgam was built. But this still wasn't right, so Volvo chief designer Jan Vilsgaard worked with Italian design house Carrozzeria Cogliona Torino to refine it. By 1984 there was a drivable prototype. The car was driven on a test track, but the team felt it needed further refinement to make it a fun, drivable car, so two further prototypes were built. Jan Vilsgaard presented the design as the B3 prototype, and it was well received. At the same time, Jan produced a C3 hatchback concept based on the 700 series, and this would be developed into the C70 in 1996. Although progress was being made, it wasn't being made fast enough, certainly for Volvo management, who were pumping money into the project. They had little more than working prototypes of the suspension, gearbox and engine. By 1985, the project had been running for seven years, and it wasn't clear when the company would start selling the car. Jan Vilsgaard's new design certainly helped the case to continue development, but with Volvo management betting the company on the new car, like they had with the 700 series, the team knew that progress had to be made quickly. By the end of 1985, Volvo approved development of the automatic gearbox, so the final package was set. And with ABS successfully added to the 700 series in 1984, it was decided that it would become a standard feature of the new car, although it would take until 1994 until that became true in all markets. New prototypes were built, and these were tested not just in Sweden, but also in North America. Some on the project still weren't happy with the drivability of the car, so it was decided to form a driving pleasure group to tackle this head on. And with car design being such a male-dominated industry, a team would focus on redressing this to ensure women got enough input into the final design. It was true that Volvo wanted the car released as soon as possible, but they also realised it had to be the right product. Car companies have one chance when a car's launched, and Volvo wisely did the due diligence up front to make it right. Volvo had the happy problem that it didn't have enough capacity in its Swedish factories to produce the new car, so it was decided initial production would be in Volvo's Ghent factory in Belgium. The team continued to refine the car with new air conditioning and other luxury features needed to ensure the car could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the competition. By 1988, further performance and reliability testing was done in North America. Like in 1984, the press got wind of the test and managed to get some spy shots of it in action. Volvo saw them, and what followed next was a two-hour car chase to try and get those photos. After catching them, the Volvo team tried to buy the shots, but to no avail. There was another blow when 40 CAD designers in the bodywork team were poached by another company. Volvo were left with a large hole in the team, and the bodywork manager was given a lot of latitude to find new people to keep the project on track. The car was named the 850, with a 5 standing for the 5-cylinder engine. 
With the 850 being smaller than the 700 series, it was decided to rename the 700 series as the 900 series. It wasn't the most logical naming system and would be abandoned just seven years later. The new X100 engine, now called the Volvo Modular engine, broke cover first as a six-cylinder in the newly renamed 960 in 1990. The saloon was unveiled in the summer of 1991. It had taken 13 years to develop and was the most expensive industrial project ever attempted in Sweden. The 850 was launched with the slogan, a dynamic car with four unique innovations. These were the side impact protection system, innovative rear suspension and self-adjusting front seat belts that made it much more comfortable for short and tall people to ride in the car. The car would have a choice of 5-cylinder petrol engines between 2 litres and 2.4 litres, plus a 2.5 litre 5-cylinder diesel. Public and motor press reaction was very good, and the car was an immediate hit. The Ghent factory was hard at work making the new cars, and over time the car would also be produced in Sweden and Canada, and even Indonesia and the Philippines as knockdown kits. Sales expanded to North America in 1992, and at this time the all-important estate version was launched. 1994 bought a small facelift, really just a small update of the front end. But the big news in 1994 was the launch of the 850 Turbo version, giving this luxury cruiser a 0-60 time of just 7.1 seconds. It was further refined in 1995, and shown in publicity photos in a yellow that didn't do it any favours, as the special edition 850T5R, giving an extra 18 horsepower. Despite the additional weight of including almost every option as standard, the car still got to 60 miles an hour in 5.8 seconds. It was replaced in 1996 with the 850R. Volvo further enhanced the car's safety with the SIPS bag system in 1995. The 850 already included airbags, but this introduced side impact airbags and it was the first mass-produced car to feature them. The 850 was raced in the mid-1990s, scoring some race wins but never becoming a breakout sensation. An all-wheel drive version appeared in 1996, further expanding the range and reaching new customers. Ride height was increased with a newly developed multi-link rear axle with rear self-leveling suspension. Later in 1996, the whole Volvo range got a name change. The 850 was renamed as the S70 Saloon and V70 Estate, V standing for versatility. And with the name change, it got a mid-cycle styling update. In keeping with the style of the time, the corners were rounded off and the car received body-coloured trim and an updated interior. Volvo had been offering a compressed natural gas version since the early 1990s, and this continued with the bi-fuel version. A bulky 95-litre tank was installed in the boot, taking up valuable cargo space, but offering up to 155 miles of additional range. Volvo launched a crossover version of the V70 as the V70XC, or Cross Country, in 1997. It used chunkier bumpers and a higher ride height, plus all-wheel drive. This didn't exactly put it in Range Rover category, but it was more than a match for the winter school run. And performance fans were happy to see new S70 and V70R models that bumped the power output to 247 horsepower and a 0-60 time of just 6.8 seconds. The car got a new generation of side airbags in 1999, along with the whip system, which tried to reduce whiplash injuries. In fact, the car was generally improved all round, with an improved automatic gearbox, ABS system, and a drive-by-wire throttling system. Volvo Group made more than cars, and the company was always worried about financing its car division. As could be seen with the 850, producing a competitive car was getting more and more expensive, which was leading car companies to consolidate to share development costs. Volvo had an abortive bid to merge with Saab in the late 1970s and explored selling off the car division to Renault in the early 1990s. With a sale always on the cards, Volvo sold its car division to Ford in 1999. And with that, the S70 and V70's future lay in their hands. 
In 2000, the S70 was discontinued, and saloon customers now had to choose from the smaller S60 or larger S80. The V70 continued production with a new design, and it's still being produced today. A big thank you to all my patrons for supporting me. To get early advert free access to new videos or to appear in the credits, please consider supporting me using the Patreon link below from just $1 or 80p a month and hit that subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.